بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين محمد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا أما بعد my dear brothers and sisters we are in our class of living Islam as I mention in almost every class the purpose of Islam is for us to live by this beautiful deen that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent us it is not for us to just know about it. it is not for us to collect some information about it some nice stories some ayat of Quran some hadith some stories of Salaf al-Saliheen so and so did this so and so did that all of that is not important obviously it's important to learn but having learned what is important is not what so and so did what is important is what you do and what I do that is the secret and it is not a secret it is open uh, if we do that inshallah we can look forward to the uh, mercy and forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and if we fail to do that then of course we still look forward to the mercy and forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but um, we will have no excuse to present before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of course Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Jalla Jalaluhu we uh, ask him to forgive us uh, irrespective of what we do or not but believe me I mean the whole purpose of Islam is to make the effort is to is to try to um, you know try to show or give some proof of seriousness with regard to our lives to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, not that our deeds are ever going to be the reason for us to enter Jannah we we do not claim that uh, nobody claims that including Rasulullah himself uh, did not claim that to the contrary he specifically mentioned that in this in a, in a beautiful hadith uh, which is narrated by Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu anha Rasulullah said that nobody will enter Jannah on the basis of their deeds and Sayyid Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu anha said Ya Rasulullah even you he said even me and then she said how will people enter Jannah he said by the Rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala despite whatever you may have done so we ask Allah for his Rahmah then she said Ya Rasulullah then why should we do any work Believe me, my brothers and sisters, the debt that we owe to Sayyidah Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu anha, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can repay her and we can reward her for that. SubhanAllah, this deen, she is one of the major uh, reasons, one of the major daraya, one of the major means uh, by which we have this deen of ours. The, uh, the, the scholars of Islam, they have said, that we owe 25% we owe one quarter of the knowledge we have in Islam to Sayyida Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu anha she was, a, she was a remarkable woman she was very intelligent she had the mind of a scholar she had this huge analytical ability um, she had courage uh, she had uh, the, the she had the love of Rasulullah sallallahu uh, and that was her shield and therefore she was able to ask him things that no other Sahabi dared to ask and remember whenever we hear things like this is not because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi was um, deliberately intimidating or he was a threatening person or anything like that there was no one more loving than Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa but it was that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed uh, on him uh, where he said that my enemies feel this for a journey of one month away from where I am and uh, obviously also his friends uh, felt this awe when they came into the presence of Rasulullah sallallahu Wallah is one, I just think about this today when we go to Masjid al Nawi al-Shari and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the opportunity to go there again and again. When you go to the Rawza al-Mubarak, uh, to the grave of Rasulullah sallallahu uh, anyone with Iman, anyone who 
uh, knows Muhammad sallallahu alaihi knows anything about him, has any sense of being his ummati, what do you feel? Uh, it's not just you're not just standing in front of some grill of some building. No, there is a there is a sense of presence. Uh, even though this is the grave, this is not Rasulullah uh, himself in person, living, talking, walking, uh, you know, inshallah, smiling at us when we meet him and we ask Allah for this, inshallah. May Allah grant us his ru'ya uh, in our sleep, fil manam, or in our wakefulness, because they have been, they have reported both of these, that Rasulullah was seen uh, by people in their sleep in a dream, as well as uh, by seen by people uh, while they were awake in a, in a vision, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for both of these. I never make choices. I never tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, give me this or that. Because Allah is not Allah is not constrained by choices. Why should I give choices? Ya Allah, give me both. Give me the, the ruyat of Rasulullah in a dream and when I am awake. Alhamdulillah, inshallah. And I ask, the, I make the same dua for all of you, inshallah. May Allah give you this ruyat. And if you get this, then do let me know that you have seen Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Uh, inshallah I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this and then I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us all of us inshallah the actual meeting the sharf of mulaqat the sharf of ziyara the sharf of meeting Rasulullah sallallahu uh, on his uh, hawd al kawthar on the day of judgment and may Allah grant that we get the cup of uh, uh, the water of al kawthar from his blessed hand inshallah and that we cross the sirat in the protection and hives of an aman of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala behind his Habib Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and enter Jannatul Firdaus ala bi ghairi hisab. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this. My brothers and sisters, so said Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu so she asked him um, when he said that nobody will enter Jannah, the basis of their deeds, he said, even you, Ya Rasulullah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, even me, he said, then how will people enter Jannah? He said, by the Rahman, mercy and forgiveness of Allah. So she said, then why must we do any work? That's the beauty of Aisha Siddiqa She used to ask the, she used to ask the bottom line questions, right? She didn't hesitate to ask these questions. She said, if that is the case, if it is dependent on the mercy of Allah, then we hope for the mercy of Allah, khalas, right? So I do whatever I, I want, I live my life any old way. Uh, good, bad, what not, anything. Uh, and then I'm hoping for the mercy of Allah. Khalas, if I get it, well and good. If I don't get it, well, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll think about that at that time. No. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, you must work because the darajat, the levels in Jannah, Allah will give you based on your deeds. So if a person says, subhanallah, one more time than somebody else, he will get a different daraja, a different uh, level in Jannah and more reward. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to enable us to continue to do our deeds and continue to work in order to earn his pleasure. My brother and sister, this is the whole issue. The whole issue of yaqeen in the akhirah is to <coughs> get the reality of that in our lives. And I get the reality of that in our lives. We know this from our own experience in life. Unfortunately, we don't seem to translate it into an understanding of the akhirah. We know that in this life, you get what you work for, you get what you pay for, right? So if I want uh, my garden to look nice, then I have to make some effort on this garden. It's otherwise the, the law of entropy, the second law of thermodynamics, which is anything which is left without attention will only degrade, will only disintegrate, will only go uh, from where it is today to a state which is less and which is um, uh, is uh, more uh, more negative right uh, you, if you just leave a garden as it is you suddenly won't find uh, beautiful rose bushes uh, springing up you will not find uh, all kinds of uh, you know beautiful flowers coming you will find weeds you will find all kinds of brambles and you will find all kinds of thorns and you will find uh, the soil will, become, will go bad and you will find all kinds of maggots and worms and so on this is the law of entropy this is the law the, the second law of thermal thermodynamics as we know uh, we know this so therefore what do we do with our, with our um, uh, worldly affairs we look after our businesses we look after our properties we look after our gardens we maintain our houses we maintain our cars we sign guarantees of we sign uh, you know uh, agreements for 
preventive maintenance uh, those of you I, I come from a manufacturing background so I can talk about preventive maintenance how many of you who come from from manufacturing background or, or even if you don't don't you understand preventive maintenance one for example in a factory we used to have one a day per week which was on maintenance uh, which was minor maintenance one day per month on major maintenance preventive maintenance before the machine breaks down you work on the machine ensure that all the all the moving parts are properly lubricated uh, ensure that you know all whatever is needed to ensure that the machine continues to work efficiently whether that machine is your car or your motorcycle or your bicycle whether the machine is a is a machine in the factory whatever the case might be right uh, preventive maintenance we understand all of this but with regard to our akhira if i ask myself this question and say what is my preventive maintenance for akhira what is my invest if i ask myself this question and say what is my preventive maintenance for akhira what is my investment in akhira what am i doing to plant trees in my jannah in the akhira inshallah i'm asking allah for jannah but when i go there what do i want to, what do i want to see in this jannah just just a you know blank uh, flat piece of earth because ibrahim alayhi salam uh, said to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he said, "Tell your people that the jan that in Jannah the land is fertile, the water is sweet. Tell them, but they have to plant the trees, they have to plant the gardens." And Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "What is the way of doing that?" He said, "Subhanallah is a tree, Alhamdulillah is a tree, Allah Akbar is a tree, La ilaha illallah is a tree. This is the meaning. So all the work we do, the zikr of Allah." Tilawat al-Quran, Iqamat al-Salah, our fasting, Hajj, Umrah, right? All of these things, all the charity we do, all the people we help, all the poor, all all those who we feed, everything is an investment. Now the point I'm making here is: Do we see that as an investment, or do we see that as a cash outflow? Now that is the main problem, right? Uh, do you see it as an investment or do you see it as a cash outflow? Because if you see it as a cash outflow, believe me, your hand will always be constrained because you will feel, oh, I'm losing something. Even though I have good intentions, even though I want to be charitable, even though I want to please Allah, net net, I'm thinking I'm losing something, so my hand will be constrained. But if I'm investing, if I see that as an investment, then what is that? What is that spending? It's not losing something; it is gaining something. Because an investment is that which gives you a return, right? What is the difference between an expense and an investment? An expense, both are both both involve cash outflows. An expense is a cash outflow, and investment is a cash outflow. But which one uh, will any person who has any understanding of of finance, who who has any vision, who has any um, understanding of uh, of uh, you know planning for the future, what will he look for? Is he going to is he going to just spend cash, which is which is just expenditure, or which is just a pure cost, or is he going to look for a way in which this cash can be spent? The same amount of money, same you know a uh, hundred dollars, ten dollars, a thousand dollars, hundred thousand dollars, million dollars, whatever, right? The same money that person is going to say, no, no, I'm not going to just give it away. I am going to spend this money. In a way, where the money earns money for me. There's a wonderful book uh, called uh, "Rich Dad, Poor Dad." You know, I read it God knows 20 years ago or more. Uh, "Rich Dad, Poor Dad." Read that. Right? He he talks about how the thinking is different. He said, "What is it that makes the children of uh, millionaires millionaires, and uh, which en- which which almost ensures that the children of people who are." Uh, within quotes, middle class employees uh, just perpetuate and uh, replicate their parents' lives. What is it? He said it's nothing to do with the amount of resources you have. It has to do with how you view money and how you view your expenses. He said that people who are uh, who, who become uh, millionaires, or billionaires, are people who anything they spend, they ensure that that thing earns for them. They never do any just dead expenditure. They just don't buy something, right? And then it is sitting in their garage or sitting in their closet or sitting in their, on their shelf or something, and it's doing nothing for them. He said everything they spend is something which earns them something. So if I'm spending a thousand dollars, that thousand dollars is earning me something, right? So that, that is the difference. Now my point is taking it to the akhirah. What is our what is our concept of the akhirah? Because any investment is based on what? It's based on 
believe in and reliance upon and trusting the person or individual or entity that we are investing with. So what do you look for there? You look first of all to see what is the rate of return on that investment. And secondly, you look for how sure is that. That is the reason why, for example, uh, government bonds get a lot of investors, even though the return on the government bonds is much less than the return on the stock market. Because people say, no, no, even though the return is less, the bond is guaranteed by the government. And therefore, this is a, uh, something which I can trust. It just won't disappear one day. But the stock exchange is a stock exchange. You know, it's up one day, down one day, and uh, then I end up, I might, end, I might get a big return, but I might end up losing all my money. And that's why, for example, you know, what, what, what is, uh, if somebody is going and gambling, why is gambling haram? Because there is no, there is no guarantee on that return. So, the, therefore, we are saying now, when, when we look at our worldly affairs, we like to, and the sensible thing is to say, I want to invest so that I can get a return on what I'm investing. Now, take it to the other and say, how do I view charity, for example, right? How do I you, uh, view the expenditure of my time? I to start now, everybody's got to say 24 hours. Now, how am I spending that 24 hours? Am I spending it in a way which is getting me a return with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah? Or is it just going away, right? I've got two hours. These two hours, what do I do? Do I sit in front of the television and I watch some, some football game or, or basketball game or tennis game or whatever, right? Okay, fine. So I, I watch that game. And may Allah protect us. Uh, you know what we end up uh, also watching thanks to, uh, you know, the fashions and thanks to uh, whatever people are wearing and whatnot. When you're watching those games, I won't go into that. But I'm saying that that is also part of the, you know this and I know this. I mean, you know, uh, we don't have to mince words and, and uh, be polite about that. But that is one option, right? So is it haram? No, it is not haram. Please spend the time. It's, it's your two hours, right? But just think about that. If that two hours, Malakul Moth came to you when your breath is going and said, you know that, that game you watched, Wimbledon uh, or, or US Open, um, that two hours I'll give you now, right? And tell me, what are you going to pay for that? Just before you're going to die, right? You're going to die, but instead of right now, I'll come back two hours later. And in that two hours, do whatever you like, you know, pray salah, what not, make wudu, ensure that you are lying in sujood, uh, so that your, your soul is extracted in a state of sadha. You can do all of that because you've got these two hours, right? Specific two hours. Now, uh, but it won't come for free. you got to pay for it. What will you pay? What is your answer? What will be your answer? What will be my answer? Today, you have that two hours free. Nobody is asking for anything. Nobody is asking for anything. What are you doing with those two hours? Please understand, I'm not talking about haram. Inshallah, you will not do haram. I'm saying even among the halal. Khalaq al wal hayata li yablu wa kum ayyukum ahsanu amala. Allah said, we have created death and life so that we can teach you to see which one of you will do the best deed. Allah did not say we will test you to see who will do the good deed and who will do the bad deed. No. It is not expected from the Muslim that he will do bad deeds. But in the good deeds, which is the better deed? which is the investment, which is a dead expenditure. So I've got two hours. One option, do that. Another option, read something worthwhile. I'm not even saying read the Quran. If you're reading the Quran, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. But I'm saying even if you're not reading the Quran al kareem read something useful, beneficial, that adds value to you. Even if you're watching television, watch something which adds value to you. Where you learn something new, you can look at the, for example, you know, you're watching Planet Earth, for example. Oh, beautiful. Subhanallah, subhanallah, subhanallah. I, I believe that watching programs like, like, and I'm not promoting BBC here. I'm saying that watching programs like Planet Earth and, you know, all these nature uh, uh, related programs is really, subhanallah, it is dhikr if you are watching it with that intention and with that uh, frame of mind where you're looking at the khudrat of Allah and you're saying, subhanallah, you'll be MD. You are the Ahsanul Khaliqeen. You make your praising Allah. Subhanallah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah. How beautiful is this? This is zikr of Allah, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Yes. It, 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 it draws your mind to saying, you know, what is it that I am doing? For example, I the, the last further reminder you would have heard, uh, preparing for the winter. Uh, I was saying there that uh, in my my daily walks, uh, now that we are in fall, and you can see that bush behind me is turning uh, turning uh, color. 
inshallah in the coming few days you will see it become completely red um, you, one of the things I noticed is a lot of squirrels who are busy um, carrying nuts and burying them all over the place right because they know that winter is coming they will be short of food so they are preparing for that right uh, so the, you, you find them burying them and beautiful the, the beauty of uh, this is that a lot of those nuts including acorns for example which are the seeds of uh, oak trees um, these squirrels bury and then the squirrels forget where they buried them they forget some of them and those that they forget they grow into trees so subhanallah the the, the planter of the oak uh, think about that look at a look at a huge oak and say subhanallah wallah alam uh, maybe this oak was planted by a squirrel literally quite quite literally this oak was planted by a squirrel um, so alhamdulillah they prepare because they know it is coming we know death is coming we know the akhirah is coming we know the barzah is coming what is our preparation because we have converted this into a uh, you know into a into an intellectual concept we like to talk about it but do we real is it real for us so that is the reason why we need to work we need to do work and that's why i'm saying ask yourself this question investment whether it's time whether it's money is it do you see this as a net cost or do you see it as an investment here who is the guarantor of the investment in the akhirah allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself right allah himself complete and total control who has allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself and Allah said, at the least, absolutely. Man ja'a bil hasanati, falahu ashru amthaliha. The one who comes with one good deed, I will give him ten like that. Reward is ten times that. Less than that is not, doesn't come. With Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what is ten times? One time is a hundred percent, ten times is one thousand percent, right? So for, for, for one, you are getting ten. For a hundred, you're getting a thousand. So you're getting ten times. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the guarantor of this. So now the more I put there, the more I can look forward to when I meet him, Jalla Jalalu. Do we keep track of that? Anybody who's doing any kind of investment, whether it is stock exchange, whatever, keeps track of that. You have a book, you maintain, you say, okay, I, this, I, on this date I invested so much in these, in these stocks, and then I, I watch this thing, how is the stock performing, is it going up, going down, what's happening, now there is COVID, now there is this, now there is that, eco economic upturn, downturn, how is my stock doing, should I keep it, should I sell it? I mean, we do all of this, right? Now with respect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what are we doing? Obviously, you're not going to keep, and keep it and sell it and so forth. But definitely, you are looking at the stock to say that, Alhamdulillah, this is the stock that I have. And I am investing with Allah and Allah is giving me 10 times the reward. 10 times the reward. Now, what is that reward? My brothers and sisters, I ask you, let us get real with our lives. Right? Let us get real with our lives. Uh, let us ask ourselves, what is it that we um, are looking forward to and what we are looking forward to is the Akhir. That is the only thing which is absolutely certain in our lives. That this will happen. Everything else, will I be healthy, will I be sick, will I be, you know, wealthy, will I be poor, what will happen to me, what will not happen to me, everything else is up in the air. Everything is uncertain. The only thing certain is, I will meet Allah one day. What is my preparation for that? I want to narrate for you, uh, to remind myself a new, a beautiful hadith which is in Jamia Tirmidhi on the authority of Ma'ad bin Jabal anhu, who said, I asked, I said, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, please tell me of an act which will take me into Jannah and which will keep me away from the nar, from the fire. Uh, Muad bin Jabal, now, Muad bin Jabal anhu, was uh, a Ansari Sahabi. He was a Sahabi from Medina. He was one of the um, he was one of the young men among the Sahaba. Muad bin Jabal, Abdullah bin Umar, uh, Abdullah ibn Umar, uh, you know Abu Huraira, All of these people, Radhiyallahu uh, These were all 
the youth. These were young people. <coughs> Who were the? These were young people. These were the youth. Sorry, somebody just came. So anyway, um, and these were the special students of Rasulullah. And Muad bin Jabal was the one who Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then sent to Yemen as the governor and as the Qadi of Yemen. So he was a very special person um, in terms of his closeness uh, to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his relationship with him. So Muad bin Jabal says that I asked Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam this question. I said, Ya Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, please give me and tell me an act which will take me into Jannah and keep me away from the Jahannam. Which will keep me, which will take me into into Jannah and keep me away from Annar, which is Jahannam. And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then uh, responded. So first he said, "You have asked me about a great matter." So now this was the way of uh, teaching that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had that if somebody asked him a good question, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would first appreciate the question itself. Right? In in, in one uh, in another hadith. Uh, one of the sahabiyat, one of the uh, ladies, she came and she asked him a question and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was sitting with, with uh, some sahaba around him. Uh, before he answered her, he said, did you listen to that question? What a beautiful question. What a beautiful question she has asked. So this was his way. He used to, uh, he used to commend people. He used to appreciate them uh, before he asked the question, before he answered the question. So he said to him, Ya Mu'ad, you have asked me about a great matter, yet it is easy for him for whom Allah makes it easy. So the first lesson we learn is, Allahumma la sahla illa ma jal Oh Allah, there is nothing easy except that which you make easy. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this and we make dua and we say, oh Allah, please make it easy for me to earn your pleasure. Right? Please make it easy for me. Um, so he said that it's easy for, yet it's easy, you've asked me about a great matter, yet it is easy for him for whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it easy. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then, then Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, first and foremost, he said, worship Allah without associating any partners with him. Now brothers and sisters, everything begins with Tawheed. Everything good begins with Tawheed, everything evil begins with Shirk. Everything good begins with us worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone without ascribing any partners to Him and everything evil begins with joining partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let us make sure that we never commit shirk inshallah in any form. One of the ways of committing shirk is to show off before people. So let's not do that also. Another way of committing shirk is to follow our desires instead of following the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So don't think it is only a matter of bowing before idols. I know you won't do that, but we do other things. So let us not do that. So the first thing he said was, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, worship Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala without associating any partners with Him. Second one he says is establish the salah, establish the prayer. He didn't say do it, read it, you know, make it. No, he said establish the salah. Third one he said pay zakat. Right? He's talking about another pillars of Islam. Pay zakat. Number four, he said fast in Ramadan. And number five, he said, make hajj to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he said, having mentioned the five pillars of Islam, because everything has to start from the foundation. If the pillars themselves are faulty, then we are not going to get anywhere. So we start from the foundation. We start from the pillars. Then he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, shall I not guide you towards the means of goodness? Shall I not guide you? towards the means of goodness. And this is another way of the teaching of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He would ask a question to get the attention of the person before he answered that question. So he didn't just tell them, do this, do that. He said, shall I tell you a way? Shall I tell you a way to keep you uh, safe from the hellfire? Shall I tell you a way to earn the pleasure of Allah? He would ask this question, right? And then people, obviously their attention would be focused. They would say, yes, Ya Rasulullah, please tell us. Then he would tell them, whatever he had to tell them. So he said, shall I not guide you towards the means of goodness? And then he said, fasting is a shield. Fasting is a shield. It shields us from the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, charity wipes away sin 
as water extinguishes the fire. What is the fire? The fire is the anger of Allah. Charity cools the fire of the anger of Allah. So he said fasting is a shield. Charity wipes away sin as water extinguishes fire. And the praying of a man in the depths of the night, right? which is the hajjud. He said the praying of a person in the dead of the night, in the depths of the night. And then he recited the ayat of Surah Sajda. تَتَجَافَ جُنُوبُهُمْ عَنِ الْمَضَاجِ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ خَوْفًا وَتَمْعًا وَمِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ فَلَا تَعْلَمُ نَفْسٌ مَا أُخْفِيَ لَهُمْ مِنْ قُرَّةِ عَيُنْ جَزَاءً بِمَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ He said, and he recited the ayah, the meaning of which is Those who forsake their beds to invoke their Rabb between fear and hope بَيْنَ الْخَوْفِ وَتَمْعًا and they spend, they spend in the path of Allah, charity, out of what we have bestowed on them. No person knows what is kept hidden for them of joy as a reward for what they used to do. And this is the ayat 16 and 17 in Surah Al-Sajda. And then he said, shall I inform you of the head of the matter, its pillar and its peak? And Mu'ad bin Jabal radiallahu says, Yes, Ya Rasulullah. I said, Yes, Ya Rasulullah. Please inform. He said, The head of the matter is Islam, its pillar is Salah, and its peak is Jihad fi Sabidillah. And then he said, Shall I not tell you of the foundation of all of that? And I said, Yes, Ya Rasulullah. So he took hold of his tongue like this. And he said, restrain this, restrain this. Mu'ad bin Jabal radiallahu says, I asked him, I said, Ya Rasulullah, will we be taken to account for what we say with it? He, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, anything that throws in people into the fire upon their faces or their noses, except the harvest of their tongues. As a may or mother be deprived is like a, it's like a, it's like a reprimand, but very loving reprimand. It's not a curse or anything. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says to him, Mu'ad bin Jabal Radiallahu Anhu says, Ya Rasulullah, he, he held his tongue, uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, like this. And he said, restrain this, restrain this. And so Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, so, so Mu'ad bin Jabal Radiallahu Anhu said, Ya Rasulullah, will we be taken, will Allah call us to account, will Allah hold us accountable for what we speak? Uh, is it only the deeds or even we, what we speak? Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, May your mother be bereaved of you, O Mu'ad. Is there anything else that throws people into the nar, into the fire of Jahannam, upon their faces and or their noses, except the harvest of their tongues? Now, brothers and sisters, SubhanAllah, I mean, the, the uh, hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the teachings of our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, there is there's an ocean of meaning in this. That ocean of meaning in this. So what do we learn from this? First and foremost, we learn in this, the lesson we learn is the desire to learn and desire to gain knowledge in order to practice it. Right? This whole thing began because Mu'ad bin Jabal Radhi Anu asked a question. If he had not asked this question, nothing would happen. But he asked a question. And what was his question? Did he say, Ya Rasulullah, teach me a good way of business, do this, do that? No. He said, my akhirah. My akhirah. So the first and foremost lesson we learn from this is the focus on the akhir. So Mahat bin Jabal is, anhu, is asking Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he's saying, please teach me something which will save me on in the akhira when I meet Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So the first and foremost thing we learn is the desire to learn and that desire must be focused on the akhira because that is surety. It is the proof of our iman. What is the proof of iman? That we believe in the akhira. That we believe that we will be resurrected. Remember, this was the thing which was the most difficult thing for the mushrikin of Makkah to accept. So, that is the first thing we learn. Then, the next thing we learn is what? The next thing we learn is the importance of the faraid, is the importance of the arkan of Islam. Right? A lot of people get very, um, uh, you know, taken away uh, by all kinds of uh, extra stuff. You know, they do making this wadifa, that wadifa, uh, this halaka on this day, that halaka on that day. Believe me, all of that is fine. 
provided your foundation is strong all of these are the are the decorations for the house but if the foundation itself if the pillars themselves are not there that house is going to collapse right so all of the rest of the stuff will not work unless the foundation is strong so focus on the foundation what is the state of my aqida my iman do i have shirk in it do i am i establishing salah not just praying when i feel like praying no establishing salah is salah my stand the central thing in my life everything else revolves around it all my programs first salah then everything else number 3 fasting in ramadan number 4 uh, paying zakat number 5 if allah has given me the ability to make hajj at least once in my lifetime am i establishing these things are these strong and firm and powerful in my life because this is the foundation if this is not there all the rest of it is fluff so is this established now once this is established inshallah then we go to the next right and rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam said islam is the head of the matter that he said islam is the head of the matter we ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us this and then nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam said salah is the pillar and jihad is the peak struggling in the path of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fighting for justice standing up against oppressors standing up for the weak raising a voice against oppressors who are oppressing people and remember it doesn't matter whether they are muslim or not a muslim is one who stands up against the oppressor no matter who the oppressor is including another muslim rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in a famous hadith nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam said and this is again his his way of teaching he used an arab proverb The Arab proverb was support your brother whether he is right or wrong meaning that he is my brother in my tribe and so no matter what he is doing I will support him so Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam used the same thing he said to the sahaba support your brothers whether he is right or wrong but now since this is coming from the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the sahaba asked a question and this is ya rasula we understand we support the brother if he is right but how do we support him when he is wrong he said support him by holding his hand support him by arresting him support him by stopping his oppression because if you don't do that if you do not stop him then he will be held accountable by allah subhanahu wa taala and he will be punished and that will be very bad for him so you love your brother you don't want him to burn in the hell fire so stop what he is doing which is wrong right this is the meaning of jihad fi sabil allah it's not conquering countries and 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 killing people or what not jihad fi sabil allah is to struggle in the path of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inshallah jihad fi sabil allah also is to struggle with yourself to have control over your own nafs to change your habits to go from being negatively oriented to becoming positively oriented to be concerned about the pleasure of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not simply be focused on pleasure of ourselves all of these things amount to jihad fi sabil allah insha allah for each one what is difficult for him the struggle is proportionate and the struggle is dependent on the individual what is difficult for you is not necessarily difficult for me and vice versa and the whole point is to do that which is difficult not for the heck of it but because that way will please allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so therefore my brothers and sisters i ask myself and i i remind myself and i remind you that nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam is teaching this to muad ibn jabal and the final thing which is said to him now think about that the final thing is which is said to him is not to do with ibadah is not to do with aqida 
It's not, it's nothing to do with tilawatil Quran or salah or hajj or zakat, no. It is to do with the people. It is to do with hukukul ibad. He held his tongue like this and he said, restrain this. By that doesn't mean do less zikr, no. Restrain it meaning what? Restrain your tongue from doing what Allah has prohibited. Restrain your tongue from ghiba, from backbiting people. Restrain your tongue from slander, from 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 uh, buhtan. Restrain your tongue from namima, for casting aspersions on people. Restrain your tongue from telling lies. Restrain your tongue from useless talk, which has no value. It's not lies or anything, but just worthless stuff. Like for example, we sit and talk about politics, right? Continuously, hours upon hours on politics. So this one is doing that, that one is doing that, this king, that queen. What is the use of that? This absolutely worthless talk about politics. So Rasulullah is saying, restrain your tongue from all of this negative stuff. And then he says, when Muad bin Jabal Radhalan asked him, Ya Rasulullah, will this be detrimental for me? Is it Allah will hold me accountable? It's like a hammer on the head. He says, Wallah, he said, this puts more people into Jahannam than anything else. Imagine this. You didn't kill anybody. Right? You didn't stab anybody in the back. But because of your tongue, because you bad-talked somebody, because you cast aspersions on somebody, because you blamed somebody, you know, unjustifiably, that gets totted up in your account, and that person's bad deeds come to you, and your good deeds go to that person. And if you have run out of all good deeds, then you just collect their bad deeds. My brothers and sisters, I remind myself and you, let us wake up before we are woken up. Because the day will come when we will be woken up. Let's not wait for that day. Let us ensure that we get up and we do what we are supposed to do and that we are not taken by surprise when Malakul Maut comes because the most expected thing in life is death. It's not unexpected. It is not unexpected except for the one who is living in complete ghafla. Death is unexpected only for the one who is living as if he will never die. And there is only one who never dies and that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hayyul ladhi la yamut is my Rabb Jalla Jalla. Nobody else. Everybody dies. Al insu wal jinnu yamutu. Every person, every created thing, Kullu nafsin dha'iqatul maut. Kullu man alayha fan. Wa yabqa wajhu zul jalal, rabbika zul jalal wal ikram. My brothers and sisters, I remind myself and you, let us live our lives in a way which is positive, in a way which we strive to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And let us consider all our actions, our expenditure, our time, our energy, money. Consider it and look upon it as investment. Because that is what it is. It is investment, inshallah. Treat it like investment and it will give you a beautiful return. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.